Have you ever heard of Huey Long? Noted politician, legendary out of Louisiana. This wealthy man in a short period of time became bankrupt. He was in unbelievable debt. And he had a group of friends who got together who loved Huey and paid off all of his debt. Imagine having friends that love you so much, they pay off all of your debts. See, people often pay off debt from the royalties on books about how to pay off debt. <laughs> That's not what we're talking about. See, freedom is a major theme in the hearts of Americans. Friends, we've got major division in our country over what is freedom. You've got red states that look at it one way, and you've got blue states that look at it another way, and we have individuals when it comes to their lifestyle, lifestyle choices. There is a major conflict in the area of what is freedom. I have a question to ask you today. Are you truly free? Does being an American guarantee that we are free? John chapter 8, verse 36 says, so if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. Only Christ can really make us free. See, many of us fail to walk in the liberty that Christ has ordained for us. You see, friends, it's not enough to be freed. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, the scripture says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. But what do you have to do next? Stand firm. Then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Go back to 1865, five years subsequent to the Emancipation Proclamation. There were slaves who were free, and yet they continued to walk as slaves subsequent to the Emancipation Proclamation. They couldn't read. They didn't hear. They didn't know how to live as free men. They didn't even know they were freed. It's easy to rationalize spiritual slavery just as easily as physical slavery. Do you know John Chavez was just 15 years old when he joined the ranks of the Continental Army to help fight on the side of the colonies in the battle of the American Revolution. He was later to speak with warmth and enthusiasm about the part he played as a young man. He knew he was a patriot at the founding of our country. Later on, he went to study at Washington Academy, later known as, you didn't know, Princeton University. During his lifetime, he was active as an educator and as a Presbyterian minister. He operated schools that turned out many leaders for the infant nation. But the one thing he was most outspoken about was the abolition of slavery. He was an ardent anti-abolitionist. You thought I was going the other way? He was a slave owner and something of a social theorist. He feared an uprising if the abolitionists had their way. He minced no words when he warned of the dangers. He referred to the slaves as abominable wretches who were lucky to be here. He considered them to be the slave owner's personal property and a man's property was his to deal with and not to be taken away from him without remuneration. How dare the government take away a slave owner's property without reimbursing him? And how could the government afford to pay for all those slaves? And he feared for the social chaos that would come with the freeing of the slaves. Danger. Greatest for the slaves themselves. John used his position as a Presbyterian minister to proclaim his anti-abolitionist views vigorously for all who would hear. Paul Ardent tells the story in more detail in his little book, Destiny, the third in the series. Paul Harvey's the rest of the story. Ardent concludes the story of John Chavez. John Chavez preached to white men and women from his pulpit and taught white children in his classroom the dangers of abolition and the right of free men to own slaves 
And this doctrine which he believed with all his heart was particularly impressive coming from John Chagas, a revolutionary, war veteran, a learned theologian, a slave owner, a free man, and a black man. That is the rest of the story. Many of us have an intense desire to be free. And so we find ourselves in a, in, in, in a birdcage of bondage and somebody opens the door, you're born again, and now you're free. And now often we just fly into another, an alternate birdcage. See, friends, unfortunately, so many of us are often incarcerated by our freedom. Adam and Eve in the garden, they had absolute freedom and only one boundary. They wanted to be free from what? The constraints of God. And this led to ultimate bondage. The Tower of Babel. It was the effort of men and women to be free from God. You see, friends, this 4th of July, only God can award true freedom. The prodigal son sold his freedom for bondage. No matter how steeped in bondage we find ourselves, God has always sought to free us. In the Old Testament, God had a solution. No matter how entangled a man became, think of it this 4th of July, the year of Jubilee. Leviticus 25, verse 8 through 10, count off seven Shabbats, Sabbaths of years. Seven times seven years, so that the seven Sabbaths of years amount to a period of 49 years. Then have the shofar, the trumpet sounded, everywhere on the tenth day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement, sound the trumpet throughout your land. Consecrate the fiftieth year. Jesus did this. And proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. Each one of you is to return to his family property and each to his own clan. What was this? A year of absolute freedom every 50 years. So you see, friends, if you had ancestral property and you lost your home, you lost your acreage, you got it back. It was returned. You were emancipated, freed from servitude. You had what was known as a kinsman redeemer. You remember the story of Ruth and Boaz? would buy back less fortunate family members, even before Jubilee, if possible. See, God's always wanted to set us free. Whom the Son sets free, he is free indeed. Here it is the liberty where in Christ has set us free. Debt during the year of Jubilee was forgiven. It was a time for letting land rejuvenate. The year of Jubilee was always preceded by a trumpet blast. Leviticus 25, 9. Then have the trumpet sounded everywhere on the 10th day of the seventh month, on the day of atonement, sound the trumpet throughout your land. See, here's the key. There's a principle here, this Yom Kippur. Repentance must always come before freedom. The Jews had to humble themselves and observe, observe Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, before the time of Jubilee. Repentance also must proceed the freedom Christ has for us. As Americans, many of us have used our freedom to purchase bondage. Many of us feel so incarcerated, we're in bondage to depression, self-abuse, addictions, broken hearts, and broken fellowship, and broken relationships, and men, we're in bondage to such social division, and racial division, and cultural division, and socioeconomic division. And yet, Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of Jubilee, way beyond the 4th of July. Luke chapter 4, verse 6 and 21, he went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, Jesus, and on the Shabbat, the Sabbath day, Look at Jesus. He went into the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. The scrolls of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. 
Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. Jubilee, Jubilee, Jubilee. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. It's on you. Because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has set me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. To release the oppressed. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he said to them, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus quotes first two verses of Isaiah 6, 61. Then this spoke of first deliverance from Babylon, from satanical bondage, but it was also messianic. Jesus was referring to the ultimate freedom, the ultimate jubilee. He called it the acceptable year of the Lord. What does God's freedom look like? Healing, deliverance, ministering to the poor, preaching salvation, freedom from spiritual slavery. Take back the territory that Satan has taken from you. He said, the Lord will feed you from his hand. No human efforts. There'll be grace. He's saying, listen, when it comes to human failure, there's nothing in God's timing he can't redeem. Just like the Levitical Jubilee, the trumpet of repentance must precede the blessings of Jubilee. We're celebrating freedom as a nation, and yet the majority of people living in our nation are in bondage. The Lord's saying, all we have to do is blow the trumpet in Zion. We have to blow the shofar. We have to repent. It'll be our jubilee. Jesus came. He died for our bondage. Our bondage to sin. Jesus, guess what? Jesus ministered the year of jubilee. First to his disciples, Luke 9, verse 1 through 2. When Jesus had called the 12, together he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases, Jubilee. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God. We've been talking about that. And to heal the sick. Jesus is all about freedom for the church. Acts chapter 1, verse 1 through 2. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles, he had chosen. Friends, you see what's happening here? Jesus gave freedom to the church. Jesus ultimately frees us to serve him and free others. Leviticus 25, 23, and that's also all the way to verse 54 to 55. The land must not be sold permanently because the land is mine and you are but aliens and my tenants. Even if he is not redeemed in any of these ways, speaking of the Jews, he and his children, God's people, your God's people, are to be released in the year of Jubilee. Blows the 4th of July away. For the Israelites belong to me as servants. They're my servants, whom I freed, I brought out of Egypt, I redeemed. I am the Lord your God. Now notice this. We are not our own. You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. But he's taken you out of bondage and placed you in liberty. Friends, when you do your fireworks tonight, celebrate that. We're also kinsmen redeemers. We're supposed to bring the life liberating freedom to others. Next, Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. Let, let's finish with this here. Leviticus 25, verse 47 to 49. If an alien or a temporary resident among you becomes rich and one of your countrymen becomes poor and sells himself to the alien living among you or to a member of the alien's clan, he retains the right of redemption after he has sold himself. One of his relatives may redeem him. An uncle or a cousin or any blood relative in his clan may redeem him. Or if he prospers, he may redeem himself. God wants you free. 
That's the message of the gospel. Social justice will not do it. Friends, even if you've self-sabotaged, even if I have put myself in this bondage, Jesus has brought us back from the enemy. John 8, 36 says, so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Romans 8, 2, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. Friends, we are the most free of people. Galatians 5, 1, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. But even though we're free, we're not our own. Paradox, a healthy tension. Christ wants us to walk in absolute freedom. Let today be your jubilee. He also wants us to be free and he wants us to get back that which was lost. Charles Spurgeon tells this great story. While in London, he encountered a street boy. He was carrying an old bent bird cage, and there was a tiny field sparrow in there. Spurgeon asked the boy what he was going to do with the bird. The boy replied, he was pretty sadistic. Well, mister, I'm going to play with it for a while. And then when I get tired of it, I think I'm going to crush it. I think I'm going to kill it. And he made the last comment with a wink. Moved with compassion, Spurgeon asked how much he would sell the bird for. Oh, uh, mister, <laughs> you don't want this bird. Uh, he said, it's just a bleeding field sparrow. When the child saw he was serious, he responded slyly. You can have this bird for two pounds. Two pounds, that was worth about $100 today. An astronomical price for a bird worth only pennies. Spurgeon paid the price and let the bird go. The next morning, Easter Sunday, an empty bird cage sat on the pulpit at the great Metropolitan Tabernacle where Spurgeon spoke. He said, I tell you this story because that's just what Jesus did for us. An evil specter named Sin had us caged up and unable to escape. Jesus came up to Sin and asked, what are you gonna do with those people in the cage? Sin answered, I'm going to teach them to hate each other. Then I'll play with them until I'm tired of them, and then I'll kill them. How much to buy them back, Jesus asked. With a sly grin, he said, you don't want these people. Jesus only hates you and spit on you. They'll even nail you to a cross. But if you do want to buy them, it'll cost your tears, all your blood, and your very life. And friends, on the 4th of July, when we celebrate temporary freedom, complicated freedom, a great country, a place that gave us freedom of our spiritual ideals, and nevertheless, it is a freedom that will come to an end. It's on this day I want you to know that Jesus set you free, friends, not temporarily, not just for a 300-year lifespan of a nation, but for all of eternity. And so together, let us celebrate the liberty wherein Christ has set us free.